Good morning. <laughs> That's as good as you can do. <laughs> Today's Friday, right? Well, I am thrilled to be here. Please uh, uh, accept my apology for being late. Um, uh, I had multiple meetings this morning, and I, it's one of the challenging parts of this job is to be all the places you ought to be and be on time. Uh, so Matt uh, tries to keep me on time. He does his very best. And Amber, who is in your class, Amber, if you can stand up and wave, is also an intern uh, in our office. She's doing a wonderful job. So let's hear it for Amber. <laughs> what I'd like to do, so I'm not talking about something that you have no interest in, I'd like to go right to your, your questions, your thoughts. I want you to really think about what you want to know about a public servant. And any question that you might have for me, uh, let me say it another way, you can't come up with an inappropriate question. You can ask me anything at all. Uh, from, you know, uh, what time I start in the morning, to what I do, to how much time I spend with my family, to how much money I make, to how I decide uh, what I'm going to do through the course of a day, to how I decide what legislation I'm going to prime sponsor or co-sponsor. So let's try to throw it open and see where it goes, and uh, we'll, I'll react from there. Because I know you're going to have questions, right? What would you like to know? What's your name? <laughs> I'm Jordan. Jordan. And what would Jordan like to know about uh, public service? Um, what does your typical day look like? Great, great question. What's a typical day look like? Well, uh, one, there is no typical day. Uh, I, 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 um, every, there's 50 members of the State Senate, so I have 1 50th of the, the population of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has about 13 million people, so I have 1 50th of 13 million people, which is about a quarter million constituents. And my, constituents my constituents are my bosses, and the 250,000 people that I serve lived within the 36th Senatorial District. So a lawmaker, I think, has three primary responsibilities. One, to write laws. Um, two, to offer government oversight, and three, to offer excellent constituent services. Uh, so each day is different. PCN is Pennsylvania Cable Network. The first time ever in PCN's history, uh, they mic'd a, a senator up for an entire day and followed me around with two or three TV cameras. <coughs> From the beginning, of, actually they didn't start at the begin beginning of the day. They didn't. I had some meetings started at 6 o'clock that morning. They didn't mic me until about 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So they, they caught me then, went through the entire day. And so that was a day that was captured. Actually, it's going to be on TV tonight for three straight hours on PCN this evening from 6 to six, 7 to 10 p.m. Um, I have no idea what it's going to look like. Uh, we had no editorial rights to that program. They just followed me around. They filmed everything, and they'll take that the 12-hour span that they covered me and pull it down into a three-hour uh, show and tell as to what is a, a typical day on that day. Uh, so I, on my Harrisburg days, Harrisburg's of course the state capital, and Harrisburg days are very busy with session, uh, preparing for session. I serve on five different committees. Uh, I, I, I attempt to attend every committee meeting you possibly can attend, um, and if there's legislation running, you need to know what bills are running. You certainly need to know whether you're going to vote yes or no in advance. You need to study those bills, and you need to know what your constituents or your bosses think about those bills. So when a bill's running, before a bill even runs, uh, our, our constituent, the press, the media, tells the people a bill's going to run or a bill has been introduced. Then that's when our mail starts coming, and today it's mostly email and text and Facebook messages. And we'll get all this communication. My bosses, my constituents tell me they want me to vote yes or they want me to vote no. So when I, when I go to the Senate floor on a session day, I'll know that 18 of my bosses want me to vote yes and three want me to vote no. And that's very helpful to know. So if I'm going to vote yes, I want to reach out to those three that wanted me to vote no, and I want to understand their perspective a little bit better. And I can't do that with every single constituent that calls or emails. We get about 125 phone calls a day and about three to 5,000 emails a week, our office does. So there is no such thing as a typical day, but I'm, we're, we're writing laws, 
uh, advocating for new laws in Pennsylvania that I think will help Pennsylvanians, uh, working hard to defeat laws that are being proposed, I'm a Republican, by my fellow Republicans. I'll work against certain of my colleagues' bills. I'll work against some of my friends that are in the Democratic Party's bills. And I'll support some Democratic members' bills. So I, I, I work for bills and against bills on what I believe to be the right for the constituents of Pennsylvania. And what helps me form my opinion is the, is the feedback that I get from my constituents. That's a very, very long answer. Yes, what's your, what's your name? Ben. Ben? Yeah, I don't know if you already said this. What region is your, are your constituents located? Like what area of Pennsylvania? That's a great, great question. Where is the 36th Senatorial District? Um, it, it, uh, in my introduction, I was announced uh, part of Lancaster and Chester County. So it's the northern half of Lancaster County, and a very, about 15% of the district is, is, is in Chester County. I have uh, 37 local governments currently. Every 10 years, the Constitution of the United States says you have to do a census. You have to count the people and where the pop how the population shift and then the um, electoral lines for House and Senate members of states and congressional members will shift accordingly. The new map is being legally contested. Yes, and your name? Ricky, where are you from, from Ricky? I'm from Northampton. North, North, I know Northampton County. Yeah. Okay. Um, how did you get into politics? Great. How did I get into politics? Um, I got a phone call one day um, telling me my, a, the township that I lived in was Warwick Township. A supervisor died in office. Roy Irwin was his name. And uh, he was a farmer. And it was a five member board. and. Uh, the board decided somebody that knows something about agriculture ought to fill his, his seat. I, um, I'm an agronomist, a plant and soil scientist. And I had an agricultural consulting company at the time, and I have a lot of interest in agriculture, studied agriculture, worked for farmers, and said, yeah, I'd love to be a supervisor. And by the way, I said, what the heck is a supervisor? So I learned, I learned quickly. So supervisors, you know, as, as elected official on a very small, a very small piece of geography, um, uh, that would be Warwick Township, right north of Lancaster Airport. And I was a township supervisor in that township for ten years. I ultimately ultimately became the chairman of the Warwick Township Supervisor Board, and then I became the chairman of the County Township Supervisor Association. So I got to know local government in, in that capacity. Now, so I served a full uh, 10 years as a township supervisor, um, still having a full-time job, because that's only a part-time job. You get paid, in that era, you get paid $50 a month. So I had a full-time job and was a township supervisor. Completed my tour of duty as a township supervisor and really liked it, but I was not ready to serve another term. So I, so I, I chose to not run for re-election. I was doing a lot of uh, agricultural consulting work, some in West Africa, some all, all over the world. And when I was home, I found out my state senator was going to retire, no, Langer was going to retire. So I asked my family uh, at the dinner table one night, I said, I'm thinking about running for state senate, but I want my family, my wife, and my, our three children to fully support this new initiative of running for state senate. Because when you run for public office, uh, you need to be, pre be prepared to be in the paper and to have some challenge, challenges uh, publicly. So we talked about it at the dinner table and I said to uh, my wife and three kids, um, I gave everyone a little slip of paper and I asked you to write a Y for yes or an N for no. And so we had this brief discussion. I said if, if everyone, and then fold it in half and hand it in to me at the dinner table. And I said, if everyone writes a why, then I'm going to run for the state senate. And we'll see what happens. And if there's one N or no, then, I, then that's not right. If somebody in the family is not interested in me doing that, for whatever reason, I won't run. Of course, I opened them up. They were all whys. And I, I ran the next day. I announced I was going to run for, for, uh, for state senate. Other questions? Yes. Your name? Uh, James. James. And where are you from? Harrisburg. Terrific. Backgrounds in corporate, corporate situations? 
Um, the, the question uh, was that I, I came from a business background. Do most people in public office come from a business background? Uh, United States Congress and in state general assemblies. The, uh, the first of all, the qualification. What what what, it, what are the qualifications for you to run for public office? For as a state senator, there's three. You have to meet it be a minimum age. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I'm not sure what that is. I think it's 20, 25. I think it's 25. <laughs> I have help here. And as a state senator is older, you, you, it's an older uh, minimum age than a House member. So, so my friends tell me 25 is the minimum age inside the Constitution to be a Pennsylvania state senator. And what's, what's, what's a uh, House member? 21? 21. 21. Excellent. Uh, so you have to be a minimum age. You have to be a re resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the United States of America. And you cannot have committed a felony. That's it. So there's no educational requirement. There is no occupational requirement. So where do members, what, what profession do, professions do members come from? Certainly business is a component. I would not say it's a majority. There's a good number of teachers, uh, professional people that have teaching degrees and taught in the classroom and either had retired or left early. Attorneys is a common profession. There's a good num significant number of attorneys that are in the gen General Assembly. And then it goes everywhere. Uh, farm, there's a couple farmers generally. There's just, just everywhere, all, all across the board. But it's not the majority of the United States Congress and the majority of state General Assembly members uh, do not come from, don't come from a business ownership perspective. Great question. Yes, your name? Uh, Andrew. Andrew. And where are you from, Andrew? Uh, New Jersey. Terrific. What part of New Jersey? Uh, Cherry Lane. Great. That's like a rich area, isn't it? Are, are you rich? No? <laughs> That's kind of a di di difficult one to quantify, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. So I've seen uh, your name in a couple of articles about the lottery privatization uh, decision coming up. Uh, how do you prepare to weigh in on something like that? I mean, what's your opinion on that? Wow. That's a great question. He saw my name regarding lottery privatization and wants to know my opinion and how I came to a, a position and what my position is. Uh, Pens we, have, we do have a lottery. The lottery started in 1972. The lottery today makes $1 billion of profit per year. That sounds like a lot of money, even from somebody from Cherry Hill. <laughs> the governor's uh, position, the governor launched his position, governor being the CEO of the executive branch of the government, <laughs> that he wants to privatize. And it was communicated to the public as privatization, but it was not just privatization, it's privatization of the management and expansion. Expansion into a brand new game called Keno, K-E-N-O, and online uh, gaming. It's something that concern, it concerns me. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and when I, when I share with you what I think a member of the General Assembly ought to do, uh, write laws, and that's be supportive of laws, work against laws, government oversight, and constituent services. Inside of my chairmanship of the Senate Finance <coughs> Committee, I have oversight it for the Department of Revenue. And the Department of Revenue was leading this mission to uh, explore priv a private management agreement for the Pennsylvania Lottery. I was visiting my son up in New York when I ultimately, Matt and I had a lot of conversation on the phone, where I ultimately had to decide whether or not I was going to hold a hearing uh, to expose this proposal uh, that the governor and his team were working on in part in private. And the reason why they were working on some of it in private is they were signing confidentiality agreements so that the bids that they were receiving could be held in confidence so that companies could ultimately, so that the Commonwealth could ultimately get the best possible deal. So I decided I was going to hold a hearing and hold the administration's feet to the fire and deliver uh, a lot more information to the public. So uh, I, cho I chose to be publicly neutral in the issue of lottery privatization 
and chose the path to say all I really want, as opposed to my own individual opinion, what I want is more access to, I want the public to have more information. That's what I desired. And I think, I'm sure, that our hearing achieved that, that end. So we, we, I held a hearing, the, uh, a lot of, uh, it's about three hours, that's my guess, about three hours or so of public testimony. We swore in uh, all the witnesses under oath. Um, so you had all that volume of testimony. Then the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, who is elected, has to make the decision as to whether or not that PMA, Private Management Agreement, is constitutional or not. She ruled that it's not constitutional. And in part, she used some of the information that was held in the, test, in, in the testimony that we held at the Senate Finance Committee. Now that she ruled it unconstitutional, the governor believes it is constitutional, uh, unless something broke today, um, we're waiting any, any day now, the governor will, will publicly state whether he's going to challenge, uh, legally litigate the attorney general's decision. So this thing is in a le legal quagmire. Where the governor's legal staff says yes, they had the constitutional authority to move forward. The attorney general's senior legal staff says no, they did not have the constitutional authority to move forward. So we have two very high level legal opinions, both contradicting each other. So in the hearing just the other day, I'm, I saw on the Appropriations Committee as well, and I asked the attorney, sitting Attorney General, would she stand before my committee if I chose to reconvene a committee hearing to understand better, as a non-attorney, these two contrasting legal opinions? And she said, yes, she would. So I continue to be neutral um, in, the, in my own personal perspective on the issue and des desiring only to get as much information into the public arena as possible. Professor, how are, we, how are we doing on time? What time do we? Time. We, we usually go to the <coughs> time, so you guys still got 20 minutes. All right, fantastic. You guys are doing great on questions. More? Yes, your name? Uh, Brett. Brett, and where are you from? Uh, Enola. Enola, okay. Um, so what uh, role does the federal government uh, play uh, in the uh, Senate Finance Committee? Uh, I know they What role does the federal government play inside the Senate Finance Committee, specifically what was the question? Not much within the Senate Finance Committee. We're constantly struggling. We have, three, we have at least three layers of government. Local government, which was the township of where I served, state, which I, where I currently serve, and then the federal government. We're constantly uh, struggling over these lines hard lines or dotted lines or artificial lines these blur, and sometimes they blur a bit between state government, what's the state role in governance, what is the federal government in governance, and what's the local uh, role in governance. Uh, sometimes we agree and many times we don't agree. So, uh, so we'd have to get into the, the, you know, the specific, uh, uh, an individual specific, specific example of, in, in order to debate the topic further but I can just tell you that we, many times, when we get into a sp specific bill, we're struggling to try to understand, is it indeed our role as state government officials to take this on, or is it the federal government's, or is it local government's? Yes, your name? My opinion of the president's uh, desire to tighten gun regulations. Uh, who, who here, uh, I will answer that. Who here has an opinion on that? Just raise your, I won't necessarily ask everyone that raises their hand. Only two, five, ten? Okay, let me ask the, the question in reverse. Who here does not have an opinion on the issue of uh, gun control and gun issues within the, within the United States of America? One person does not have an opinion. <laughs> one person does not have an opinion, about one third of the class has an opinion, and that leaves two thirds <laughs> somewhere in the middle. 
Um, we have a national constitution, and every one of the 50 states has a state constitution. Does anybody have the state constitution with them right now? No, I don't either. Um, in the state constitution, Article 1 um, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it talks about the issue of guns. Um, and, and we should look it up. Um, maybe somebody can do that now on their computer. Uh, but it's very clear, the Pennsylvania State Constitution is very clear. That's the guidelines by which I took an uh, oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And it says, um, and I'll get the language wrong. Is somebody looking it up? Oh, great. Oh, she has a constitution. That's a state. <laughs> What's your name? Julia. Julia. That's a state constitution? Yeah. Okay. From Nick, of course. It's from the PMA. Uh, from the, uh, good. All right, can you, it's, it's very early, it's in Article 1. Uh -huh. Have you found it? Is it Article 1, Section 2? No, it's only Article 1, I don't know uh, the... Of the state constitution? That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's Julia, right? Julia's looking it up, she'll have it in a moment. Uh, right to bear arms, I think, is the, is the title. Yeah. You found it, oh, great. Can you read it, please? It's just one sentence. The right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves to, and the state. To bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Shall not be questioned. That's it. End of sentence. And there's not, no more. Where the federal constitution, of course, talks about a well-armed militia, and then you get into this whole debate about what did the founding fathers really mean about a well-armed militia. That's not there. Uh, the right uh, to defend yourself. Uh, shall not be questioned, and your right to bear arms shall not be questioned. Of course, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania right now, if you commit a felony, uh, you will not gain access to, uh, to legally own a firearm. That's today. Um, we're, we're debating this. So, so I do believe, I, I believe in the right to bear arms. I believe in a person's ability to be able to de defend themselves and their property. But I'm, of course, very, very concerned about um, the misuse of firearms. So, uh, so here we are in the midst of this debate. We have members of the General Assembly introducing all kinds of uh, legislation to further restrict the legal right uh, to own a firearm. Uh, I, I'm, ha I'm happy to engage in any of those conversations and debates. Some members don't even want to talk about it. I'm happy to engage and listen to all sides of the issue. But in the end, um, I believe that a person, a law-abiding citizen, should have the privilege and the access, has the constitutional authority, to own a firearm. So I want to make sure that that continues to be protected. Now the question begins, there's all kinds of questions, and you have many of them. You know, what, what, what is a firearm, and is a pistol with, with six rounds, should, should a citizen have equal access to that as a, as a, a weapon with a large clip? Um, should we have further restrictions? Should it just be a felony conviction would not allow you to own a firearm, or should it be something, some other level of um, uh, violation? Do you have something to add? Well, I was just going to ask you possibly on like any kind of distinction between a weapon for personal defense and one that is designed for warfare, um, as far as a citizen's right to own a weapon that can be used to assault individuals rather than defend themselves. Your name? Ryan. Ryan. Uh, Ryan makes a great point. He's, he's getting to this division of uh, the intent of the weapon, uh, as opposed to defensive versus offensive. I th you didn't stage your question that way, but that's how I interpreted the question, where uh, he believes some firearms are very much offensive weapons, and maybe we should not permit those where a defensive weapon would be more acceptable. Those are, that's a very valid point of debate. Um, I I'm not prepared today 
um, to, uh, I, I would want to make sure that if we further restrict firearms, we're getting the results that we intend. So the question would be why restrict? And the answer would, would be, at least in part, because we want less murders. Uh, does, for, do further restrictions result in less murders? How do we come to that conclusion? They tell me Chicago has among the most strict gun regulations in the country and has among the highest per capita murder rate in the country. That's what I've been told. So I think we need to be thoughtful. I think we certainly need to be, uh, we, we should not shut down debate on this really important sensitive topic. But I'm not, I'm, uh, th th there, are be there are elected members that want to legally get rid of all guns. There are members of, of General Assemblies in the United States Congress that want to have hunting only uh, weapons. And then there's a huge, and then there are members that want no change at all. So there's just a huge variety of opinion, but I think we can all agree that a weapon that's used to take another person's life, uh, the person executing that crime needs to be severely punished. And that leads us into these debates about gun control. So thank you, Pierre. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Nick. It, it, it's challenging. It, uh, it really is challenging. You, we're all citizens. Our friend P Pierre, you're a citizen of Germany, right? <laughs> but we're all we're all citizens, and we have a right to our opinion. When you take elected office, right, right now, of course, your friends would care to one degree or another about your opinion. But you have an opinion on almost anything, and the, and, this, and the reaction to your opinion outside of public office is relatively limited. You develop an opinion, and you're sitting in public office. Now a lot more people have an opinion on my opinion. So I, I, I've, I've learned that. I do a town hall meeting very frequently where I, uh, it's a very similar format to this, where I attempt to answer any questions that emerge and listen listen to uh, my bosses, my constituents. I think if you're in public office, it's really important to not allow yourself to be isolated from your constituency. And if you are not cautious, that's what happens to you. Because every, t um, because it, it's, cha it's challenging uh, to be in the public arena. Uh, t today you're being, you're, you have to be assumed you're being videotaped or your comments are going to be taken and captured and used against you in the next election. Politicians are frequently concerned about that. I'm not. I th so so uh, my, my, part of my answer anyway is that I think it's incredibly important in the development of your thought process to be as open-minded as you can. To, to make sure you're being connected, not to just people that support you, not to just people within your own party, not just to pe people that look like you, think like you, walk like you, have a similar background. Now, that, uh, you're just getting kind of reaffirmation of this potentially wrong perception that you have when, when you fall into that trap. I think this is really, really important to uh, the best way you possibly can, and, it's, it, and it takes some level of effort to expose yourself to the most diverse amount of audience and constituency that you possibly can. Uh, that's why I'll get into, even though I'm a senator from Lancaster and parts of Chester County, I'll go into the big cities of, like Philadelphia and I'll understand their perspective. When I was chairman of the Senate Ag Committee, we, I held, here I am, an agronomist, plant and soil scientist, 
worked for 25 years in the field, and people would call me an expert, and I would re reject that opinion. I have, I have a college education in the field, and I have 25 years experience, but I just reject that, 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 you, that Mike knows everything there is to know about agriculture, because of course that, there is no one person that knows everything about any topic, in my opinion. So I wanted to learn. So I did a listening session around, around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was either six or eight, somebody probably already knows the answer, either six or eight uh, listening sessions across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The first one that we did was in downtown Philadelphia. And because I wanted to understand, and nobody, and, and, they, and, and it was the warmest reception of all, of all the, of all the uh, listening sessions I did. They were so eager to come talk to the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee, because people within the city of Philadelphia generally weren't exposed to that kind of opportunity. But I wanted to know what they thought about agriculture from their city perspective. That's a perspective of which I'm not from. And uh, so I think, it, in part, my answer is that you need to stay connected to a very diverse cross-section of your constituency? Great question. More questions? Or comments? Yes, your name? Well, I'm Robert, and I'm from Tyler County, Pennsylvania. And I want to know, how did you gain support and popularity while you were running for this race? How did I gain support and uh, popularity? <laughs> um, I announced that I was going to run for the state senate, and uh, I ran. Uh, opposing me was um, a uh, successful businesswoman, and uh, the the uh, past chairman of the Republican Party for my county, and a successful banker, and myself. So those were the people uh, that were in it, at least at the end. Um, I, I was told um, at the beginning that I didn't have a chance, um, didn't have a chance. And actually, I was, after I did the little survey within, with, within my family, I didn't announce right away. I still thought about it. And then I was told, and what, what actually convinced me to move forward is uh, after the second or third person told me I didn't have a chance, I decided to challenge that perspective. Um, and to run uh, against the uh, chairman of the party, retired, recently retired chairman of the party, who I know quite well, was, was a steep, steep hurdle and a successful businesswoman. Uh, so um, I thought about, I, I announced and I thought about it and I just decided to be as open and transparent as I possibly could could be, and to um, care, uh, I do care about people, and to attempt to show that I care about people, and to um, say that if, if I'm elected into office, it, it will, won't be about me, it will be about me working as hard as I possibly can, can to listen and understand my constituents' perspective, and to act accordingly, act and react accordingly and put the people's interest be, uh, in front of my party's interest. So that's what I've tried to do. And um, in the end, I got the endorsement. It takes two-thirds of the committee persons to vote for you in order to gain an endorsement. And uh, so we all stood before the entire committee of about 250 committee persons. and. Um, the lowest person on the, the person that receives the fewest number of votes is removed. Then they recast the ballot again. Then the next lowest person uh, that's on the bottom rung of the ballot re receipts gets removed. And in the end, there was just uh, two of us left. And uh, when they recast that ballot, I had about 68 or 69 percent of the vote. So I got the endorsement of the party. Um, and then I ran, but I still didn't assume the endorsement meant that I was going to get the votes of the people. I realized that I was going to have to work really hard, and I did. I met with every single committee person that wanted to meet with me, and I met with every single person that wanted to meet with me to understand their perspective and promise them I would do the, the best job I possibly could. Yes?
separated by population, and if they aren't, do certain districts get more money from the state, and how do you decide what you want to do with that money? Great question. Your name? Ben. Ben from? Phoenixville. Ben from Phoenixville. Uh, yes, Ben, uh, 50 state senators and 203 House members make up the Pennsylvania General Assembly. Uh, I believe it's the second largest ge General Assembly in the United States, second to New Hampshire, which has 400 and some odd members. Uh, the uh, House members and the Senate members all have equal population. Senate members all have equal population, but about 250,000. House members all have equal population, about 60,000 constituents. Uh, and every 10 years we do the census and redraw the lines accordingly. So my, my, my geography is relatively tight. Um, it, go, well, it goes from Cochranville down to the southern, end of Chest southern part of my district in Chester County, up through Gap and New Holland and Lidditz area, Ephrata, uh, Columbia. Um, but every 10 years they redraw that map because populations within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania shift. And the population of this Senate district, the 36th Senatorial di District, grew 10 times the state av average for population growth. So as a result of that, then I needed my, my future Senate district, should, I, should the voters vote me in, would geographically would shrink, but I would still have 1 50th of the population. Yes, your name? Uh, Al from Hershey. Al from Hershey. Thanks, Al. Uh, liquor privatization. He's right. It was recently introduced. I'm in the Senate. It's in being introduced in the House by Mike Terzai, the leader of the, leader of the um, Republicans in the House. The governor supports this, this perspective. Um, I do believe that um, it, the government ought to be in the business that only government should be in, and if the private sector has the ability to do the job, the government should get out of the way. I, when it comes to liquor, uh, I think the, the state's in a position of significant conflict of interest. We advertise, we encourage adults to consume alcoholic beverages. We pay for that advertising. Uh, the companies pay for the advertising. We do a joint, joint uh, release. We, uh, the state's, in this, and of course, in the business of selling liquor, and the state's in the business of enforcing liquor laws. I think that's just a conflict. So when I look at what the state ought to do, it ought to be in the enforcement business and get out of the sale and the promotion of liquor. Well, then how do you do that? Well, uh, Mike Terzai now has a proposal, and then I'll ask a detailed question that I can't answer about how will those licenses be sold. I'm told um, uh, this, the Senate's perspective right now, and there's 50 senators, so we can all have our indi individual perspective on this, but the gen uh, general conclusion of the Senate is let's let the House lead on this. If the House passes something, then it's going to come to us in the Senate, it has to, and then we'll dig in and study and modify it the way that we believe to be uh, most appropriate. But I've been told that the House bill would not uh, permit more than twice the number of liquor outlets that we have today. They would be sold on a lottery system and it would be sold through, what's the state agency called, Matt? That the state agency that would uh, hold the sale of the liquor licenses? D DGS. D DGS, Department of, what is that, Governmental Services? General Services. Department of General Services. So, so th uh, they would hold those, um, uh, those auctions. And it, somehow, the, somehow the private sector would attempt to find a center for the, um, for the sale of those, the value of those licenses. Looks like, Professor, how Maybe one, one, maybe two more questions. One, one or two more? Yeah. Okay, anybody here that's not, uh, you can e either ask a question or if you just simply want to make a statement. Okay, it looks like we have two. Well, let's take both. Your name? Will. Will? Great job. And I was wondering uh, how much money you made. 
You want to know? Will wants to know how I was. I always love that question. Uh, how much money do I make? Grand total or just in my state job? Yearly. Yearly. Okay. Uh, this. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, I think it's eighty-three thousand dollars. Not saying that's right. Eighty-three thousand um, uh, dollars. I don't take the annualized increase. Actually, we, we get an increase. A COLA, C O L A, cost of living increase. We 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 get that. Um, when the indic financial indicators weren't an increase. And uh, members ha have three, at least three different positions. They just take it. Uh, two, they offer it to a charity. Or three, they give it back to the Treasury. And there's a very small class of us that give it back to the Treasury, but that's what I do um, on the COLA, on the cost of living increase. But it's about $83,000 a year. Now, yes, ma'am, your name? The coolest small town in America. That's right. But anyway, I want to thank you for your leadership and specifically uh, as a professional with with the leadership role. Uh, I really enjoy and appreciate the very warm tone that people are giving to the decisions that you're making. Thank you so much. Your, your first name again? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. That, that's very, very kind. But well, th this job is, um, I'm in halfway through my second term. I don't know if I'll run for a third term or not. Uh, this job, um, I've worked in, I said, told you I worked in the private sector for 25 years. I've put more hours uh, into this job uh, than I did in my private sector job. And I worked a lot in the private sector job. It's not unusual at all. As a matter of fact, it would be typical for me to work a 12-hour day. Um, very typical to be 12 hours. Wake up in the morning, start to return emails, um, uh, do one or two or three or four coffees with individual people that don't want to come into an office. So the office is just too intimidating. They want to meet you in a local coffee shop. Meet with people one-on-one, uh, -on -one, meet with people in small groups, and attend the various meetings. Do, it's, it's a tremendous honor to be able to serve. It, it, and it's really, there's a uniqueness to this job that you'll find in no other job. So I hope some of you will consider this type of a job in your future. Because you get to, when you get to meet with people, they open up to you. And they tell you their uh, w one or multiple problems or challenges that they're having in their life, and they're looking for help. In some cases, some people have nowhere else to go. Um, so if you really care about people and you want to take the time to sit down and listen, uh, it's incredible. Um, the exposure to true raw humanity that you get when you're in this job. And then, you, you can, if you do your job well, you can develop a pretty wide circle of friends. And so sometimes a solution can come from government, but sometimes when you hear a, a real compelling story, you can, uh, um, somebody uh, recently told me they fell on really hard times, and I don't know what day of the week it was, but I posted something on either Facebook or a website or something asking for help. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't more than a day or two. So I had 35, between 35 and 40 people that wanted to help an anonymous person that I had identified. I stood up. I, was, I, know, I knew who the person was. But I didn't reveal the identity of the person because the person didn't want to be embarrassed by it. But I said, I, you trust, if you trust me, I, you know, we'll get the the right kind of help, counseling help and financial help, help to pay their rent, help to pay their utilities. And uh, 35 to 40 people stood up and helped this other person. Government, taxpayers had nothing to do with that effort. So sometimes you can help people inside your formal role in a governmental position. Sometimes you can use this sphere of relationships that you're offered to do the right thing. So I, I hope, how many uh, would consider a job sometime in the future in public service in this classroom? I knew you'd raise your hand. That's fan. It looks like about uh, one, one third of the class. We'll, it's not for everybody. This kind of work's not for everybody. Uh, but I'm thrilled that uh, some slice of the best and brightest young people that we have today are willing to consider a role in public service. I think it's absolutely critical. 
that we keep attracting among our best and brightest students to, to have a potential career in public service. Professor, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's been an honor.